I just want to thank our sponsors, uh, including the Greater Columbus Arts Council, the Ohio Arts Council, White Castle, uh, the Columbus Foundation, UBS, and uh, the J Japan Foundation New York uh, for generously making this all possible and also making it all free, uh, which is wonderful. Uh, so uh, let me just introduce our next speaker. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Irene Valensis is a comic scholar writing her doctoral dissertation on representations of mental illness in graphic memoir. Uh, Irene is also a full-time comics editor with Highwater Press and a critical writer for the Comics Journal. Uh, she's the co-editor of a special issue uh, with the Journal uh, of Graphic Novels and Comics entitled Mental Illness and Sexuality in Comics. Uh, so please, uh, please welcome her. Hi, everyone. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Yes, wonderful. Thank you for having me, CXC, and thank you all for joining me today. And thank you for that lovely intro, Ben. So who am I? Ben covered a little bit of it, but I am a comics lover. Give me any comic. I want to read it. I'm a comics editor. I'm a comics scholar. I'm a comics journalist. Sometimes when I'm lucky, I get to curate some comic shows. And I've also been a comics arts festival organizer. So that's a little bit of my background. And who are you? You might be a cartoonist scripting your own work. You might be a comics writer, but not a visual artist. You might be a cartoonist visualizing other people's work, or you might be something else entirely. So I'm hoping to speak to all of you in some way or another today. So I have a couple of disclaimers. One, I am not a comics creator. I know, just let's get it out there. So what I'm gonna show you today are some guidelines. They're not hard and fast rules. Of course, there are many incredible cartoonists who break all of these things. But if you're looking for a place to start, these are good general guidelines to go with. I'm also not here to tell you how to write your story. I don't care how you write it. Post-its, cue cards, stream of consciousness, um, index cards, anything else you could think of, write it the way you wanna write it. But when you're ready to submit it, these are good tips to follow. So you can organize yourself in a way that a publisher can read really effectively, or you can work with collaborators. And the last disclaimer is, even the best edited script is still a best guess, especially if you're working with other collaborators. So think of it as a really good roadmap, but a roadmap that is flexible to detours and other obstacles in the way. So, if you have any questions, I know there's time for questions at the end, but as we're talking, if something comes to you, you want a clarification, please just go ahead and raise your hand and I'll take the question as we go. I also, as you may have already noticed, talk really fast. So if I am talking too fast and you didn't get that, please put your hand up and I'd be happy to slow down. Okay, so why do we want a script edit at all? Well, first and foremost, acquisitions. You have a pitch, you have some concept art, you wanna send it out, that's great. Maybe the publisher is interested, but the first thing they're going to ask you for is a comic script. If not a few chapters, a whole script. We wanna see what's your grasp of breakdown? What might the page count be? What strength is your writing? We want to determine these things before we go ahead and give you a contract. So knowing how to do some of these things on your own first when you're going through your own work is a really great way to speed up the acquisitions process and get a yes. Also, there are collaborators. That's why there are scripts in films, right? There's lots of people on a film. There could be lots of people on a comic book. You want to have clear instructors instructions for your letterer, your colorist, your line artist, whoever is working with you. And one of my favorite points and something we're starting to do at our press is accessibility. So if I have a really good script, I can turn that into a comic audiobook, I can turn that into alt text, I can turn that into literary image descriptions. But if I don't have a strong script to start from, that's much harder. So in making comics accessible to neurodivergent readers, to low vision readers, having a great script is imperative. And I think that's a really exciting part of script writing. Okay, some basics you need to know, but I won't really cover here is structural editing. I'll go through a quick gloss and what the standard comic script form looks like, which can help you organize your thoughts for presentation. So what is structural editing? It's like the biggest level editing we can think of. It's knowing your audience level. If you tell me your book is from four to 24, you don't have an audience, I'm sorry to tell you. But a really great way to know who your audience is, is what is the age of your protagonist? If your protagonist is 45, 
it's probably an adult audience. If your protagonist is six, probably a six-year-old audience. So that's a good way to gauge. And that helps you figure out who your target reader is and what they might need. Oh, and I didn't mention, because I see some people doing it, yes, please feel free to take pictures of these slides. I know this will be available later as a recording, but you're more than welcome to take pictures of my slides. You want to make sure you have a clear message all throughout, that there's a logical progression to your story, that you think about those scenes, transitions, acts transitions, and that if there's anything like lyrics or a likeness or a reference or a quote, you get special permission for it. So those are the very big level kinds of edits we look for out of script. Where can you find more about comic script editing? Shelley Bond, who is here this weekend, amazing, has an incredible uh, book and will probably be available during the exhibition tomorrow and on Sunday. So please feel free to look it up. Uh, and it's a wonderful resource for all levels of artists and editors. And uh, on Blambot, you'll also find a standard comics script form, which is really accessible to everybody. So you can go ahead and take a look at that. And I'm giving you an example of what that looks like on the website here. So you can see some really overarching things in the overall script format. You have a clear page break. You have clear panel breaks. You have clear spaces for descriptions or any references and clear areas for different character speech. This helps the letterer know where they're going to put what kind of dialogue or if it's a caption or if it's a thought bubble. And this is the other half of that. So you can see kind of what a general comic script template looks like. So I invite you to go to that website and look it up more for yourself. So overall, this is what we're gonna cover today. It looks like a lot, but we'll take it step by step. We're gonna make sure we don't have mysteries in our script. We're gonna make sure we have a good page rate, that we think about things like recto verso reveals, and I'll go into more detail later on all of this. Thinking about laying out double page spreads, how we start and end a scene, pages, panel sizes, story actions, words, more words, lots of words when we are writing and editing a script and putting it all together. Any questions before we keep going? Everybody good? Okay. So, no mysteries. Your script should read like an Ikea manual. The artist should know generally what to draw and any details that are important, and the letterer should know who is saying what, where, and why. Okay, this is an example of a first draft, and you have no idea how many times I get this. A mysterious figure enters the room. <laughs> what? <laughs> like, how do I draw that? What is that? So if we want to edit that further, we'll say Bill, who will later re be revealed to be a ghost, enters the Victorian living room. Bill looks like a transparent humanoid shadow instead of a fully formed human. He presents as a 30-year-old man wearing slacks, a white button-down shirt, and suspenders. This leaves a lot of room for your artist, but it also tells me, okay, Victorian living room. Very different than the living room at Versailles, very different than my personal living room, okay? So this gives you more of a suggestion of what's happening while still giving the artist lots of room. So this is the first double page spread of a book called Dreams that I worked on, and you can see how much visual information is in these two pages, tons. But it's our establishing shot. We're getting to know this character, what he's thinking about, what his worries are, influences around him. Uh, this character happens to be in a very kind of chaotic environment, and so his personal environment is hyper-controlled. And this is what that script looked like. We don't need to read all this. We see it here. But we can see the breakdown of what kind of posters are on the wall, what the age of the character is, that they're listening to music, what the lyrics of the music are on. There is a lot of writing here but we're gonna see that over the course of two pages. So it's actually not too much writing, okay? So let me give you an example of it, the first draft of another work I'm working on, Little Moons. And we're gonna kind of workshop this together. So I get the following. Spread two, her sister walks into the kitchen and scruffs the girl's hair as she walks by. Hey Dora, how was school? Stop calling me Dora already. What am I supposed to call you now? Oh my gosh, stop, et cetera, et cetera. What are some of the editorial issues we might find with this example? In the yellow skirt here. Um, it's too, uh, the dialogue might kind of, I don't know, 
it might be a it might be complex to have that dialogue like so much back and forth in a, even even if it's a right so we don't have clear dialogue instructions we see a lot of back and forth but we don't know who's saying what somebody else had a hand um, in the back in the strict shirt checkers That's too many actions we actually have, yes, there's too many actions, but we don't really know how many actions per page there are here. Yes, in the NASA sweater. Uh, it's, it's already limited to the novel. Like, two, like, this makes sense. Yes. So this is an example of prose writing. And this writer is a prose writer who is doing comics. So there is different structures we have to think about when we're doing comics versus prose. All great answers. Thank you so much. So you'll see when we edited the script, we had to take those things into account because the writer would not be drawing the book. So we had a page breakdown. We had to put panel breakdowns in. You're right. How many actions? Let's find out. We need to know who is saying what to who and how. Disgusted versus all in caps. Okay. You guys are all great editors already. <laughs> so we also didn't have character names for each of the characters. We had the girl and her sister. So we want to make sure everybody's named. If you are drawing Clark Kent and you are drawing Superman, those are two different people, even though they're the same person. Spoilers, spoilers. Same thing. <laughs> Batman, Bruce Wayne. We want to know who is interacting at what point, right? And the artist clearly needs to know that. So it should be consistent throughout the script. You following me so far? Any questions? Okay. One page of verbal script to one comics page. There are a lot of great reasons to do this, even if it seems like there's a lot of blankness in your comic script. So the script informs the book's page count. It also informs how much you're going to pay your artists over how many pages. It's going to inform how much action you can fit on into each page, how much text can be spoken, what the pacing is like, and it's also going to give me a one-to-one -one correspondence between the art file and the script file. So when I'm looking at page one of the script and looking at page one of the art, it should be the same page. So should 23, so should 99. I should be able to see the script and look at the art page and know it's the same and not have to find it. Okay, so we're gonna go through a few of these um, as we go. So what if it's more than one page? What if you've written a page and a half for what you think is a one page comic book or one page of your comic book? Well, it's time to assess. Are, th are there really just a lot of references and descriptions in there, hyperlinks, things like that? Because that won't actually show up on the page, so that's okay. Maybe we can leave it in. Are the characters giving several long Shakespearean monologues? <laughs> Maybe it's time to cut that out and uh, go for something shorter and sweeter. Is there any place that seems like it would be a natural break and we should put another page break in there? Those are the kinds of questions you can ask yourself. Okay. So here's an example of another script I'm working on uh, called The Search for Glue Scap. And this is over two pages, okay? So this is what I had as one page of a comic, okay? So we have Boog. We got the fish, now we just need to do something. Uh, the serpent emerges from the water with a fishing line in his mouth. Mally says, let's go, but it's my favorite rod. Honestly, let's go. Hands it to Mally, Boog looks hungry. The serpent lets out a roar, we're still going, run. <laughs> the serpent coils deep into the end of the pool, emerges, snaps out and angers, is trapped. We get it. Now, if we're looking at this from an editorial perspective, what are some of the issues we see in the script that we could edit? Ah, uh, yes, right here in the no, floor. Sure. There's no panels. There's no panels, so we need a panel breakdown. Anything else we could add to this script in editing it? Yes, sir, in front. Uh, too much is happening. Well, <laughs> we don't know how much is happening, there's right? Like, there's like three pages of action at least. Sure, so yeah. there's a lot of action and no clear understanding of the pages. Yes. Uh, sound effects are being described. Right, so we have we don't have a sense of what's dialogue, what sound effects, what the letterer is going to do. Yes? There's not really a description of what time of day, like, is this a pool in the woods? Is this a pool in a field? Uh, right. Yeah. There's no establishing description here, at least in this scene. It might have come earlier, but from what we're seeing, we can't tell that. Good. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay, so we have no idea how many pages this will translate into. That's the first level of breakdown page, right? The biggest level. We need to know how many pages. So we don't know, as has been pointed out, how much time is passing. What is the artist drawing here? How many book pages will all this action that's being described take? Okay. There's another editorial issue, which are, are, as has been pointed out, no panel breaks yet in the script. 
So that doesn't give us a sense of the pacing. Or if there's a big moment, like a big roar for the serpent, is that half a page, a quarter of a page, a full page? How much is that for the dynamic and dramatic sense of the story? So we need to get a sense of those two big level things. So what can we do? If it doesn't fit all, all into that amount of space, we have to start asking ourselves, do we need to cut out dialogue? Are things being repeated, things we don't need to say? Should we spread this dialogue out into multiple pages? The basic idea here is if you have 100 pages of a Word document, but it really translates into 125 pages, a visual action, then you've added 25% to your cost of the book, 25% to the cost of each artist on the book, and that's not giving me as a publisher a true sense of how much we're going to invest in this book or how much we can pay our artists. Or if you're publishing your own work, how much you can do that. So making sure you have a good sense, not just for the story, but for the final out product that will be a book that funds will go into, it's good to have as accurate a sense as possible. Any questions before we move forward? Yes, sir. Uh, so what you just mentioned about panel layouts, like how prescriptive should a script be about what the page layout is like? Like this should be a large panel, a small panel, or is that more of a conversation? That's a great question. So the question is, how much information do you put about panel description into the script? And there are a few ways to go about it. So firstly, if I have a, a page and it says page 16, and you see five panels listed on the page, because I see panel one, description, panel two, description, then you get a sense that there's five, page, five panels on this page. And then the artist can work to, if you're not the artist yourself, can work to see what the flow will be. And they might change things. They might say, you actually don't need this panel or this panel can push to the next page. But you get a sense. And we're gonna talk a little bit about timing later. So more of your question is going to be answered. Uh, you can, however, put things like splash panel, panel one. So we know it needs to be a big panel with more room. Good, okay. All right, let's keep going. Recto versos and reveals. Maybe my favorite thing about comics in general. So what is a recto and verso? So a verso just means even page number. Left-hand page, I have to do this because I don't actually know. Um, and recto is the right-hand side of the page or always the odd number. So how that helps you is what, when you're doing your one-to-one -one script and you can see page one, page two, you know whether that's a recto or a verso. Because every time you flip the page, you have a chance for a little reveal, you have a chance for a little surprise for the reader. So I'll show you how this works. Uh, I just went through all that, so that's great. And that drives the motion of the book. That drives the forward momentum of the book. So here's an example one of a first draft. Uh, character one, do you want to go to the dance with me? Character two, sure. Here's an edited example. Character one, bottom of the page. Do you want to go to the dance with me? Page flex, suspense. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't go to the dance with you if you were the last person on earth. Do you see how we made like a little pop? Like, what are they going to say? Are they going to go? Are they not going to go? So that moment is like are the reader's joy. Give them a surprise. End on a question. Think about how that page is turning and how it can help you. Okay. So this is an example from one of the books I edited, Blanket of Butterflies. And we have Shinobu here trying to track down his family's ancestral sword. He goes to meet the nefarious Benny the Bank. Uh, Torchy and Sven are falling down from the trees, and there's this like standoff looking at each other's eyes. So this is um, the right hand page, and we're gonna flip into a double page spread. So that moment between like, now it's on, but what's gonna happen? Into this epic two page fight scene is a part that was scripted. It's scripted right in there. We know that we can put those dramatic pauses and how big they're going to be right into the script. So that leads me into talking about double page spreads. So when do you wanna use those? Maybe never for your comic, that's okay. But if you are using them, big opening establishing shots are a great place to put them. Big climactic reveals are another great place to put them. Uh, and they're used best when in combination with a recto verso reveal, like we saw just a little while ago. So when you are coming to the end of a page and can also reveal into a double page spread. Oh, so here is 
uh, an example. So this was one of the establishing shots that I showed you at the beginning of the of Dreams Volume 1, where we learn a lot about this character we're going to spend time with. Here is the opening two-page spread of a girl called Echo. And we have a very lone figure in an enormously vast landscape. This character kind of time travels back uh, onto the prairies and, and is kind of recovering her history at the same time. So we want to show the epic scale of the land at this time and the figure's kind of smallness within it. And again, from Blanket of Butterflies, the Dene people were asked to mine their uranium. Uh, asked is too gentle a word. That went into dropping the bombs on Hiroshima. And so this uh, elder is recalling that time. And so we need a lot of space to show the calamity that happened to both sets of people through warfare. Okay. Any questions about recto verso reveals before we move on? Yes, sir. Yes, that's a great question. So the question was, are there production issues when you're creating a double page spread? Yes, always. So just like any page has a, a safety and a bleed area, you can do that the same thing on um, uh, on a double page spread and account for the gutter. So things that are, let's let's go back and we'll show an example. So you can see down the middle, there isn't anything important happening, right? The elder is on the one side, the bombs dropping are on the other, each figure in the midground is on each side of that divide. Here as well, you're not gonna lose any important information down the middle. So yes, you constantly want to be thinking about that, laying out a page template for yourself. And always the production team is happy to help. So I know if my artist is, worried that this might not translate right, I'll say, great, let me go send it to the designer in production and we'll take a look for you and they'll give you any notes because I'm not smart enough to know what those things are. So I have somebody who knows how to do that. Look at it for me. Okay, but absolutely. Great question. Any other questions? Okay, so starting and ending a scene, how do we think about that in a script? So. I like to think about it this way, you don't have to, which is at the, the top of the page is kind of the place to start thing you've seen instead of the middle of the page. Um, and you can think about the opening panel like the topic sentence of a paragraph kind of sets up the page for you. And then the last panel is kind of like the transition sentence to the next page or the next paragraph. It's gonna conclude something, but kind of push a question in the new direction. And everything in between gets you from point A to point B. So that's how I like to think about it. And so this comes to a question earlier, how do we kind of determine the panels per page? And as we probably have all read Scott McCloud, space equals time in comics. And I like to think of it kind of like music. There's a rhythm to it. How many panels increases the pace of the page and fewer panels decreases the pace of the page. So that's a good kind of way to think about it is how much time do you want to take up? How fast do you want the story to go? Uh, and that can depend on the genre, action versus romance, different kinds of timings. Uh, a good benchmark is five to seven, not a rule by any means. And I'm going to show you uh, some exceptions to that rule. So we have here uh, on one side, the nine panel grid, on the other side, the four panel grid. So if I'm playing music, I'm going to try to do this to the mic, I might go, that's nine panels. Four panels. You hear the difference? There's a different kind of pacing there. Three. Okay, like so that changes the pacing of the story. So this is an example from Petals, the follow up to uh, As I Unfold You in Petals, the follow up to A Blanket of Butterflies. And this was a, originally scripted as five panels. And the more that I was looking at it, there's a kind of call and response. Curtis, the main character here, is trying to call on his spiritual helpers, the little people, to come back and help him and help his community. And there was this really kind of beautiful call and response between waiting for the little people, seeing if they would respond, and his pleading with them. And so I thought, you know, I don't think five panels really captures what the writer was trying to do there. And so we uh, experimented with a nine panel grid, and all of a sudden we had this beautiful kind of alternating, faster paced rhythm, but you could really do this shot reverse, shot reverse, shot reverse, um, each time that you were calling upon one or the other. So that's an example of a different kind of pacing. Uh, these spreads come from little by little. 
And what we have in the one side of the spread is the protagonist in a place of stasis in the same part of the panel, while each time the surroundings around him change. He's moving from school to school to school to school, getting bounced around. But his personal situation is exactly the same static, right? On the outside, not a part of the community. Uh, versus the page right next to it, which you see the panels getting smaller and smaller and the tears thinner and thinner as he sees all this conflicts and disregard and, and violence and it just feels so much more pressured the more he goes through it and the more he observes this. So these do not follow that kind of grid rule, but are excellent layouts for what the narrative is trying to communicate. That's the most important thing. What is the story trying to communicate? And use every tool in your toolbox, including layout, to do that. Make wise narrative choices rather than like cool looking narrative choices, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. Any questions about that before we move on? Okay. So, panel size and shape. How do we think about it? We talked a little bit about this just a little bit earlier. So here is an example of time lapsing over four panels over the course of a year with this kind of swirling light background. And what kind of stays the same through all that time is the relationship between the young protagonist and his teacher, right? Or we have this beautiful double page spread where the protagonist is just ensconced by books which really make the gutters of the layouts, right? Very kind of fluid, intricate work. So the artists, of course, will always bring a lot of their own artistic vision. But at the basic script level, we should be thinking about how much time and space is that going to take? How much does any one moment need to be impactful? What are the overall needs of the scene? How do we transition those two things? So remember, it's a roadmap. It's an IKEA manual. Oh, and I just want to go back to this um, image just once. This image was scripted exactly like you see it splash page, you know, half this way, half that way on the diagonal, this is what they'll be saying. So we knew exactly what it was gonna, going to feel like in the script level, and then the artist took that transition and made it their own. And a good way to determine how many panels and what's in each panel is to determine what the essential story actions are. And that's going to create your basic beats. Okay, so I like to say that action equals money. Uh, and I like to think about it this way. If you're going to have an artist draw that, if you are not the artist yourself, ask if it's worth drawing four times. Is it worth roughing, penciling, inking, coloring? Because that's how many times they're going to do that same page. Okay? And if a page is approximately 300 US per page, is that important enough, whatever you're writing, to spend $300 on? And I'm going to give you a little example here. So in Dreams Volume 2, a book I'm working on now, uh, there are four pages where the protagonist, Damon, went to his old work, had a conversation with his boss, explained how hard he worked all summer, explained how he saved his money, and picked up a junker to take on a road trip. Was that worth $1,200? <laughs> and the writer agreed that it wasn't. So what we did is we took that four-page sequence and made one word balloon out of it and like i just gotta go pick up that car tomorrow and we're ready to go cut next day starting the road trip so what we did is we spent those four pages explaining that he saved all of his money to get this car to show his vision quest at the climax of the story which was a great way to spend those four pages and very engaging for the reader so you can ask yourself what's the heart of the story and what's peripheral to the story and sometimes it's good to think of things in terms of also foreground and background actions. Um, and we should try to have one of those in each kind of section. So unlike a film or a play, you can't do multiple things in a panel. Not really. You're trying to communicate something through sequential static images. So checking how many verbs you have at any given time is a good way to do that. Um, so for example, this is one of the first drafts of Little by Little, and panel six had Mama gets up and takes the baby from the crib and she kisses his head. Panel two was a social worker wheels the food tray over and sets the briefcase down. Panel three, Mama wipes her face with the side of her arm, sniffs, she keeps her eyes on the baby and rocks him. 
I'm not sure how we were going to show three things in that same panel, um, but by highlighting the verbs, we can say, okay, this many actions can't be shown clearly to a reader. What is the essential action of the scene? Is it picking up the baby? Is it kissing the baby? Is it putting the briefcase down? Where is the weight of the story? And by knowing what that is, we can choose which actions we want to describe our story. Any questions? Okay, so how do we choose the most impactful moment? So we already talked about comics are a static medium and we're trying to represent motion through them. That's the great trick of comics. So we want to make sure that we keep the most impactful actions. And again, this will be informed by your story overall. And I like to think about it in terms of keyframe animation uh, when choosing an action. So that's the idea of you can show every little piece from one end of a movement to another or you can show the most important part of the movement. And the same can be translated to script actions. So we can choose like the subtle emotions or we can choose the part that has the biggest impact emotionally in the press, in, in the, on the page. And I am referring to a little bit of Eisner here. It's amazing to be in the Will Eisner seminar room. I love Will Eisner. Uh, so Will Eisner has a page in Comics and Sequential Arts uh, with a gentleman crying saying, I'm sorry. And so we can tell that that gentleman is sad. But we can also tell it in a bigger panel if he's hunched over or crying to the sky. But we can tell it even more on a splash page in the rain with a small figure with a huge slab of concrete <laughs> above them. So how much emphasis you want to give that moment in your script? Is it going to be a small one ninth of a page? It's gonna be a little bit bigger with more body gesture. Is it going to be a big splash page? Those are all essential actions you can determine at the script level. Any questions? Yes? What was the name of that book Eisner wrote about? Uh, comics and Sequential oh, Art. Cool. I very highly recommend it. Just a, just a footnote, the original art of this is in the other room right now. Oh, yeah. So uh, the original <laughs> art is just in the other just room. The original so, <laughs> and I'm sure if you ask the people at the Billy, they will show you the pages of a contract with God during the tour. So uh, please take as much uh, advantage as you can of being here this weekend. All right, let's move on to word count. I'm checking my own word count as I'm looking at the time. Uh, part one, amount of words. This is the hardest and most painful part. Uh, in Shelley Bond's Filth and Grammar uh, comic book secret editor's guide, I said that all wrong, I'm sorry. Uh, she's got a great book though, please check it out. Uh, Neil Gaiman roasts himself about how many words he used in his early works and how proud he was to have like 70, 70 words to a panel. And you know, as a prolific writer and a lover of words, I'm sure he loved doing that. But as he continued with comics, realized that that wasn't as feasible or even as necessary to the medium. So a good kind of gauge I like to use, and it's not hard and fast, is 15 words per balloon, no more than three balloons per panel. And you want to think that every time you put a balloon on the page, that is needing to be in balance with the art itself. So how is that working harmoniously with the image? You don't want a small panel with a lot of crowded balloons. That's not good for the art. It's not good for the reader. So you really want to think about that spacing. Okay, so this was the first draft we got for panel one panel of We Are the Medicine. <laughs> <laughs> and this artist or this uh, creator has so many important things to say. They have important things to say about being indigenous and police brutality and stereotypes in society. But perhaps this many words in one panel wasn't the best way to describe those important ideas for a comic. So we want to ask, it's all very important, but what is the essential nugget? Are there more limited ways to express those same ideas. And so we can assess, right? Are there repeated ideas? Sometimes I find a writer will put two lines that are nearly identical and they're either getting to the more to the point in the first line or the second line. It's like they're trying, they're trying to figure out exactly how to say it, what's the best way. Are there unnecessary filler words? 
comics are not like having a conversation. We get to edit, right? What's the most economical words we can use to get that point across? Um, does the dialogue have enough room? Is there enough room for that much text in the panel? So, and that the balloons need space around themselves to breathe. So we can use a guiding principle, like everything that the writer writes, the letterer has to letter, and you want to give them the most efficient script when you get started. You don't want to write it all, have them letter it all, and say, by the way, I want to take out some words. Mm -hmm. Nobody will thank you for that. So give them the tightest script possible, and it will take a few tries to do this, mm -hmm. and you'll get your friends in on it too, uh, and it's really hard, but you can do it. So word count part two, show, don't tell. That is the biggest principle I think of comics. So you can have the I'm sorry balloon, or, and I have modified Will Eisner's great work here, apologies Will Eisner, uh, you can take out the balloon. Both panels convey the same thing. You can get the sense of remorse. Do you need the dialogue to say I'm sorry? I'm not sure, right? It depends on what your story is. But if you can show it, show it every time. Okay. So remove any dialogue that is self-evident. Remove any dialogue that recaps what the action just showed. Explain something that's already been shown. Is it lengthy? Do you need to break it up over a couple panels? You can make all of these different types of changes and more. You're not limited. Okay. Maybe it's something you take out of the dialogue and put back into the description for the artist. Okay. And most importantly, and I cannot emphasize this enough, leave room for silence. Silence is an incredible tool in comics. It's really impactful. So you can show what the character is feeling instead of saying what the character is feeling. Do you need to pause after a big verbal bomb goes off between the characters in a conflict? You take a minute and show the character reacting to how that made them feel before they start speaking. Will you add intensity or effect to the tension and conflict if you leave some silence in there? It doesn't have to be go, go, go. It doesn't have to be all words. So whatever you can take out or add back in the silence may help your story, may help your character uh, development, may help your conflict development. Okay. So this is an example for Dreams Volume 1. And we have these two characters in conflict. She's trying to just get him to open up and just trying to help him. And he's, of course, very angry. And she's like, you know, you're not the only one with problems. And this is like a moment that kind of takes them aback, you know, that kind of only being in your own world. So there's silence incorporated throughout these kind of reverse perspectives of these two characters in this moment of conflict. Making, I think, the page much more powerful. Any questions before we move on? Okay, so we gotta put it all together. It's not one of these things, it's all of these things and they're always moving, which is the hard part. So it's a puzzle. There's no hard and fast rules. You can put it together any way you want. If you're looking at a moment and you want to expand that moment into a double page spread, do you need to edit pages before that so you can end on a verso so you can reveal it? Do you need to expand or condense a scene? Is there ways you can cut down on the, on the verbal language, on the dialogue? Is there a repeated action you show in the text? Is that repetition important or is it just there because we weren't really noticing and we were trying to get to the point? Is it necessary to the overall story, thinking about that four page sequence of picking up the car? Is that what the story is about? Or is the story about the quest he goes on? Okay. Do we need to accommodate something by changing the panel shape or size, give it more room, break it down into a series of smaller panels, and so on? You can look at all of these factors in many passes of the script, but this is just to get you started. Okay, and I know it says questions here, but I'm going to go through one more thing with you. Uh, in Shelley Bond's Filth and Grammar, there's also something called a beat sheet. This is a really great tool for outlining your story. So what it does is it sets up a chart and you have scene on the one side, that's what the S is, DPS, double page spread, PPP, panels per page, page number, P, hashtag, characters in action. So the idea is 
on every page, that's our standard count, there should be one action that happens for sure. If you don't have any verbs in your one point of your outline, you need to put a verb in there because nothing's happening, okay? <laughs> so, and also the characters that are doing it. So here we have from A Blanket of Butterflies, page one, Sunny and Shinobu examine, that's what they're doing, a samurai armor in the Fort Smith Museum. It's one line, it tells me what's gonna be on that page. And it might take me about five, six uh, panels to say, to say that much. Does that work? Does that work with the story pacing? So on and so forth. We go through about five pages and we get to the next scene. If you haven't gone to the next scene in, you know, 25 pages, it's time to rethink. It's time to break that down into smaller chunks, okay? If you have 23 panels on one page from this one action that you're trying to do, maybe, might not be, maybe it's too much. So this is a good way to start your script by outlining it, outlining it or taking a script you already have and putting it into this chart because then you'll say, do I have an action on this page? Is it clear? Do I have clear characters on this page? How many panels did it take me to express all this? Is that too much? Is that too little? So you can see it at a glance rather than trying to work through an enormous script that might be, you know, 100 pages. Okay, so that just gives you that idea. All right, that is my whole spiel. Uh, and I'm happy to take any and all of your questions now. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Yes, in the back with red mask. Thank you. Oh, it's red with red. Um, do you have any tips for writing a comic where you're not really in control of like the page placement? Like when you submit something for an anthology, you're not sure if it's in your comics are gonna start on this side or on this side. Oh, that's a great question. So the question is, uh, do you have any tips for writing comics when they're, you don't have control of the page placement? Because for example, it could be in an anthology. If you're not sure, a good way to translate that is to just make sure each page is encapsulated in itself. So the largest you will go is a single page splash. So that helps. It doesn't quite help with the recto verso reveal, but even across the midline, there is a small gap between the time you are at the bottom of the page of one page to the top. So you can still use the same principles. The other thing you can do is you can ask the, the volume, the edition, the editor production, if they can take that into account when placing your story. So for example, uh, I have seen anthologies which have a blank page on the left hand page and then the story still starts on the odd numbered page as if it was a book and then you flip through and if it doesn't come to a natural end they add again a blank page or the the author's bio or something so you can also inquire if it's really important to the way you're telling your story great question thank you yes in the front here i have something to add to that please as an editor of anthologies great i would love to hear it yeah. uh, do you want yeah do you come on come, come on <laughs> get up here uh, would you please use the mic because they're recording all right i'm sorry i don't mean to butt in here so i am an editor of an anthology series in cincinnati to answer your question whomever asked that when you are laying out your panels please use squares and do not do the little angled panels because when we're laying out your pages, we don't know necessarily where your pages are going to land and on what page. And just like we talked about with the rectoversal, if you put an angled set of panels in and it needs to be on a different page, you're really messing up the flow of the balloons and the reader's way of reading the page. So just keep that in mind if you ever work on anthologies. Square and rectangles are your friend and one splash page. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate that. Uh, yes. Um, so if you're editing something and it's for print, um, is, you might correct me here. Um, I think it's yet to be like it's divisible by four with your pages, maybe. Oh, that's a that's a good question. Okay, so the question is, if you're preparing something for print, does the story have to be divisible by a certain kind of page number? 
And I'm going to give you a little bit of a security answer because it depends on the press. So for example, we work with um, a fast printing press, a kind of on-demand press that does things like our advanced reading copies, and we can do a page number within two. Okay, but our standard press who does our, our copies that go out into the world, um, that's divisible by eight. So it's different from press to press, but there's also ways to get around that. For example, back matter, front matter. So maybe the last page is your bio, right? So you can do your whole thing that you're ready to do and maybe a splash end page, an ad, a little write up about what the story is, a little write up about, about who you are. So that's how we determine our signatures, which is how many pages are the books. We have to determine in pages of eight. So we start with the script, see how much that is, see if we need wiggle room, and if there are a few extra pages, we get to add on either side, title pages, bios, extra fun stuff in the back of sketches and what have you. So a little bit circuitous. Perfect. Any other questions? Yes. Forgive me for being ambitious here, but what if you have an ensemble cast? Scripting for something like that is would be part of that's a good right question yeah yeah i get what you're saying so the question is about uh, ensemble cast and scripting or using the beat sheet here and outlining so there can be parenthetical things to your script, like character sheets and designs. I do a character write-up with all of my write-ups, every single character, even the minor ones. What are they wearing? Do they have earrings? Are they wearing a crossbody bag? Any tattoos? What have you? Glasses. And then I have to check for that in continuity. So having a list somewhere is a good place to have it. You might decide to have a separate, separate character compendium for, let's say, your artist, and just put the character's name in there, and they can refer to that compendium, you can make a separate timeline and say in the description, refer to timeline document A. Whatever else you need to add to your script, the clearer you can be, the better, and you can make your your other items more efficient that way. Right, yeah, and that's kind of to help you guide like if it's referential material in the description, yeah, you can go more than one page. But if it's like several pieces of dialogue or several pieces of action, that's where you can know to break it up. Excellent question. I think we have time for one more question. And later, out in the hallway, I'm happy to answer anything else you might want to know. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, so how would you determine whether you want to be like a writer or an editor or an artist? How would you go about figuring something? Well, I have no artistic ability. No, <laughs> no, no, no that's, I, I like to draw, but not necessarily draw sequentially. Uh, I love to read, of course. Um, it's very good to know what it is you want to do. If you want to write your own comics, if you're trying to change other people's comics into being what you want them to say, you don't want to be a comics editor. I always start with my author's voice. What are they trying to do? I don't care about what I'm trying to do. I care about what they're trying to do and clarify and amplify it. I find a lot of creative joy in that process. I find the process of comics editing thrilling because I get to see a book in progress. I get my little tiny fingerprints on it where I'm like, what if it was like an extra panel that did this? And I'm overjoyed. You can hear it right now and be talking about it. So that's how I knew I wanted to edit comics. Um, but I want to help take somebody else, whether they're new or a veteran, just make that slightly tighter, slightly more to the next level, push them in a direction that they weren't thinking. But if I want to write my own thing at a later date, then I will write it separately from that. Um, and maybe if I try my terrible drawings, I will add some pictures to it. Um, but that's how you know. What do you love to do? What do you want to devote your time to? Uh, what gives you that sense of accomplishment? That's how you know. Thank you so much. See you. See you. You've been wonderful. Have a great rest of your weekend. It's a pleasure.